One of the foundations of Chinese medicine is that if you want to know about living things, you look at living things. If you want to know about dead things, you look at dead things. And Western medicine has that flipped, where they try to use dead things to learn about living things. Hello and welcome to... <laughs> Why are we talking about rabbits? Rabbits. Those are things that quickly reproduce on the interweb. Today we don't talk about those things. Today we talk about Chinese medicine. That's right. James Mohabali, a Chinese medicine specialist, joins me as we try to figure out what the heck is the heart. This is Watar. James Mohabali joins us for some fun. Although it's kind of crazy. Check it out. So we're here, and this is interesting. We're back with my Chinese doctor who takes care of me and who's, are you a little up, upset with me because I've fallen <laughs> off? I haven't had, when's the last time you put me under the needle? Well, a good doctor never punishes his patients. <laughs> <laughs> I feel punished sometimes with the horn. Will you explain to people on Watar? What the horn is? A horn. So is it a horn? It feels it, like a horn. It happens. It happens to be a water buffalo horn. It could be anything. Um, you know, I could use a spoon. I could use. Oh, seriously? I could use a coin. In fact, some people call it coining. Uh, the the term is gua sha. Because oh, you could use a coin. Yeah, um, but it's uh, it's scraping the skin is the technique, but it doesn't doesn't break the skin. Um, but the idea is to break up surface stagnation, release muscles, um, expel wind and cold, all that good stuff. And so, it, guys, this is not this is not a massage. <laughs> I call it I call it a massage technique. I said, oh, we're we're just gonna do a very gentle massage technique. Um, <laughs> if if it ever becomes painful, just let me know and uh, we'll stop. No, and, it's um, not painful. It's fantastic. Let me just let me just clarify. It's the thing I kind of go up there for. Mm -hmm. um, but I've become a full practitioner and believer in this. And it's Eastern, and that's kind of where we start today. So what I want to bring you on to talk about is the heart. And so a lot of what we do on Watar is people consider it sort of heartish. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not heartish in the truest sense, or at least not in the way that I think of it when I hear East. I hear nous, which is the Greek for spiritual eye. Mm -hmm. Heart here kind of feels like emotion mm -hmm. in, in terms of the West. But what I want you to speak to as a doctor is the actual heart, which I think is going to have two meanings mm -hmm. or one meaning and two yings and yangs. Tell us about Western medicine to start as a study. You're a scholar of medicine, mm -hmm. being a doctor. What does Western medicine tell us about the heart? So Western medicine, um, really the beginning of what we could call empirical Western medicine starts with the heart. It starts with William Harvey, which is just from an enlightenment perspective, it's this absolute triumph where... For 1,500 years, um, there was this received traditional knowledge from Galen. Mm -hmm. And Galen was a Greek guy. He's about 168 or so. And he had this understanding of anatomy that was based on dissection. Um, it just wasn't great dissection. And so he thought that the... What's bad dissection? <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it was it was Greece, you know. Yes, <laughs> it was actually, ancient Greece. It's ancient Greece <laughs> couldn't yeah. have been too good. But it wasn't practiced in general as a as an. He's improving something that was hit and miss for a thousand years. Right. Yeah. So Harvey Harvey did um, he did vivisection by Harvey's time. Um, it was acceptable to dissect human cadavers. It was not acceptable at right. Galen's time. It wasn't acceptable in ancient China or you know really in. Uh, any kind of pre-modern China up to the 1900s or so. Um, so it's Harvey had this triumph, which was that he found out that 
uh, the blood circulates and that it goes in one direction and then comes back to the heart. Right. Um, that was Harvey's main thing. He did this through um, just working it out, th through thinking it through, um, and through experimentation where, you know, he has all these diagrams where he, you know, does such and such to the veins and um, he finds out that the blood only flows one way in the veins mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, arteries squirt and veins don't. So something must be different there. And and this is straight enlightenment stuff. This is like, yeah. wow. This is like... We are being enlightened. He was studying at the school that like Galileo was like teaching at, right. you know, it was... It was real deal enlightenment. Right? And then he establishes a type of template for circulatory system and it stays in place for a long time. Right. It stays in place until the modern day. I mean, it, Harvey's template, unlike everything else in Western medicine, which is continually subject to review and renewal, mm -hmm. the heart has really stayed untouched since Harvey. Like we really basically think that it's the same way as that Harvey laid it out. Okay. Um, but central to that issue is that Harvey didn't propose a mechanism of action. All Harvey did was he said, you know, this is the heart. It goes one way, comes back the other way. Sometimes he uses the language of pumping, but he other times he uses the language of a vital force. The main thing he, he uses vital force. Right. Because it's medicine I and mean, medicine. It's the study of the living being. It's right. the study of a vital force. Right. Um, the central thing that makes the Harvey thing interesting is that Descartes, in his discourse on method, he was just kind of going through how to think and, you know, going through basically a rubric for enlightenment thinking. Mm -hmm. And he says, Harvey is the best. Harvey is the absolute, you know, paragon of like what we should aim for in terms of enlightenment thinking. And Descartes is actually the one who suggests that Harv that uh, the cardiovascular system is a mechanical pump. So Descartes, who has no medical knowledge. No, he's in a house contemplating his own thoughts. With his melting ball of wax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's melting everything down in yeah. his mind. And now he's going to weigh in on the heart mm -hmm. and the circulatory system. And it's mechanical. Because he wanted to, he wanted to remove the vital force. And he wanted to say that this is this is a mechanical system. We can analyze it mechanically, and he co-opts Harvey's innovation into his own philosophy. Interesting, and and so is this mark a new period in what is what Descartes doing? Mark a new period in the way we think in the West? Is it a type of? Is it a? Is it a? Let's put it this way: Is it an? intervention that's bad from your perspective as an eastern practitioner of medicine well um you know eastern thought you don't have to say bad yeah i know you always tell me not to say bad or good i would say that it's a major difference um and it's in some ways it's a refinement um, in some ways, it's a perfection of the trends that were already present in Western society. Mm -hmm. It does mean that the West is becoming less Eastern. Um, you know, there's all kinds of books about, like, uh, one famous one that I haven't read is, was Pythagoras a, uh, a Chinese, you know? Okay. And it's it's like this interchange of knowledge between Greek and China, or Greece and China, it looks like they think the same way, especially mm -hmm. the further back you go. Um, Heraclitus is something I'm always talking about as being like ultra Chinese. Right. Um, so one of the things I've said in past Watar episodes is that you, you have to understand Cartesian thought to understand who you are mm -hmm. today. And if you're going to try to practice things Eastern, like Eastern Christianity, you have to undo something like your Cartesian mind. You have to sort of like roll it out and, and, I think recapitulate on some level who you are, you understanding yourself differently than the way Cartesian thought has come to us. Is medicine in that same position right now? Or it, in other words, is there a vital force in Chinese medicine that is the heart and that isn't found necessarily in the chest? Yeah. So the, Getting, we definitely have to reverse engineer. Being being that I'm, you know, we're all in the West, presumably, who are listening to this, or at least we're inculcated into that kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, we do have to 
step away from Descartes in order to understand Chinese medicine. And we have to go back to a different type of thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is, there is that aspect, the Chinese medicine view of the heart. Um, I mean, first the, the Chinese medicine view of organs is that they are, they don't exhibit the same mind body duality that Descartes loved. You know, it's, it's not like you're a, a meat sack that has a, you know, thinking part inside of it. Okay. Like the heart is the center of cognition, this heart it's, um, all of the emotions come through the heart and are experienced by the heart, even though they primarily affect other organs. Go back to the uh, cognition. The, so the, the central uh, important feature of the heart, um, I'll, I'll step back even further. Uh, in Chinese medicine, each of the organs is thought of in terms of an empire um, or a village or what have you. Um, so, mm. The liver is the general, the um, spleen is the granary official. Um, there's, there's an official that's associated with each organ. And the official of the heart is the emperor. So nothing happens in the empire without the emperor knowing about it. Um, this is helpful. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, as exalted as the emperor is in the empire and as much respect as he deserves... Also, the heart deserves that respect, and the heart, you know, it has some very specific attributes. Um, you know, for example, give, the, yeah, give us some. Well, the heart is um, it's the residence of the shen, um, and the shen is the spirit. It's the it's where so the soul in Chinese medicine is really stored in the blood. It's not it's not uh, the blood itself, but it's stored in the blood, I kind see. of resides in there. Okay. The abode of the soul is the blood. And the heart um, is really the residence of the Shen in that way. And the heart governs the blood okay. in a way. Um, so the other thing about the heart that uh, the empire analogy is very useful for understanding is that there's actually two kind of hearts in Chinese medicine. There's the heart, the Xin, and then there's the pericardium is how it's translated, but it's really a bad translation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a uh, Xin Bao or Xin Ju. So it's a uh, heart wrap or heart master, heart host. Um, so there's these two separate hearts in Chinese medicine okay. and the heart host, heart master or heart wrap it's a type of minister fire um, as opposed to the sovereign fire of the heart. And the minister, he really controls kind of what the heart sees, what the emperor sees. Like the emperor doesn't really just go out and, you know, go around the empire, like looking at stuff. Like the he, minister gives reports. In, in, in Hinduism, it would be a consort. Right. It's, it's a way for the emperor to see properly through like a vehicle. And is that, does that sound right? That's, that's totally on point. The, and part of the idea of, um, of the pericardium in Chinese thought is refining your pericardium, um, and refining your heart through your pericardium. So there's, there's always this dynamic, right? So the emperor, you know, he's this, uh, flamboyant figure who just like wants what he wants and he'll like, <laughs> you know, he has no concept of what regular life yeah, is like. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> He's an emperor. <laughs> yeah. And um, I always uh, give the analogy of uh, children that like, you know, if you look at a child, their heart is like fully turned on. They they just go out and they do whatever they want. Mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm. no concept of propriety mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're just and that's that's beautiful. And that's in some ways, that's something that we really strive to obtain in the spiritual life. I think I, well, even in just life, if you're just talking to someone that, you know, in the checkout line and they have a child, there's just some attractiveness to the simplicity of the child. Now, there's, there's, bo there's bah humbug people who don't want kids around. Is that the heart? Is, is that what we're attracted to? The, 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 uh, we would say innocence in the West, but the vitality, are we being attracted to the vitality of, of, of the child, which is really the same heart that we share on some level in Chinese medicine? Yeah. Um, so the way that this... I mentioned that there's no mind-body division. Okay. Um, I mean, there, there is a little bit, but essentially there's a spectrum, right? So you, um, when we think about children being more exuberant in their heart, we think of it 
um, not just psychologically with like they're more sharing, they're more caring, um, but also that their heart rate is just literally faster than ours. It means that their heart is just going faster and they're like oh, more right. engaged that's with right. the world. That's right. So it's it's all on this beautiful kind of spectrum of physical and spiritual. So go back to the the the, the emperor. Mm-hmm. He has a consort, or I don't like that word for probably for our audience because it's a weird word. It there's a vehicle by which the the information comes to the to the emperor, mm-hmm. the minister, the minister. What's the other thing you mentioned, which is the the fire that is. Uh, what was the word you just used? Uh, uh, so there's the sovereign fire. The sovereign fire. Which is the heart. What, what is, what's the difference? Is the sovereign fire the seat of God? Um, so it's understood that the Shen that we have, and this is just kind of part of Chinese medicine, the Shen mm-hmm. that we have is really borrowed from a greater universal Shen. That's just how we think about it. Okay. Um, so the thing that the heart is capturing it's just trapping this thing very briefly, um, this this life force, and you know when when we die, it goes away and it goes into back into the universal shen. Okay. Um, so that's how the heart kind of um, how the sovereign fire is a is a mirror of the sovereign fire of the universe. But it's but it's yours. You're an individual. Yes. In, in that sense, it's. I am, you know, John with sovereign fire that identifies me. Is it, is it, I'm using, you know, the Western construct that I, I am not God. Right. I am the creature, but I have within me a type of Godness logos. Right. Is it similar to that? It is, it is very similar to that. And the, um, the, the central idea in Chinese medicine is that the Shen is really like an agglomeration of uh, circumstances of, um, you know, genetics. It's it's constantly in, in reference. Is it identity? Is it? It's so, so the, the there's this great question. Uh, the, the whole also here's another thing that's going on right now. As people are listening to this, they're thinking this is incredibly fascinating. And also, is it just a bunch of hooey? <laughs> 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 there is a hooey factor right now, right? You must hit the hooey factor practicing this in North Carolina. Does somebody come in and say, what in the Lord? I was just having a sore back. Like, <laughs> is anybody, what's the hooey factor? That is, I don't even notice it anymore. Like, it's it's like people, <laughs> people just come at you and they're kind of like dumbfounded, you know, but... The fact that I that this is just so much of how my world is shaped means I, I, that I, I don't even like they usually sign on because they're like, well, that guy. I mean, he seems pretty smart, right? Because like, they're already in your world view. Like right. they already somehow got into your space, right? They're they're looking for something. Yeah, they need something. This is really interesting. So when they start to hear you talk about the heart as having, it's like an emperor. It has a minister. Do they want to? Couch it in a, some sort of Western Christian or biological way, or or do they want you to keep going? Do they do they want you to take you to this this Eastern sort of understanding of themselves? It it really depends on who you're talking to. Um, I would say that the number of people that are coming to me that are willing to completely discard their philosophical system and to sign on to whatever I'm saying is very very few, um, and but the number of people that I try to talk to about this are relatively few and far between. I mean, if sure. you think about the history sure. of Chinese yeah. medicine, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. they're treating peasants, they're treating people that have no education. They're not. They're not trying to right. teach people, right. you know, the the finer points of physiology. I get that. So in many ways, this is um, this is a discussion that doctors would have. This is a doctors. Watar thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a podcast thing. But that said, the. Um, Many people, they do need to hear parts of this information in order to heal, right? So if you have I see, yeah. if you have heart mm-hmm. disease mm-hmm. and, you know, you've been going to a doctor and they say like, well, you know, you have blood pressure problems and you have cholesterol problems and everything that you have is just this lab value and we can tell from, you know, based on this test we took, um, they are, and they say, I want you to help me with my mm-hmm. heart disease mm-hmm. or my hypertension, mm-hmm. uh, 
they're not in a position to know what they need to know in order to heal, right? Because they're just thinking, oh, I have this physical problem. And rea in reality, the heart, like I said, it's always physical, mental, spiritual. Mm -hmm. So often mm -hmm. people with heart disease, the things that they're struggling with are much more existential. Um, the things that they're they're struggling with have to do with their human connections, right, which right, is the purview right, of the heart. Right, right. So when someone comes in with a heart problem, where is their problem? Now, don't give me, I, I want the material answer if there is one. Mm -hmm. I, I hear what you just said. It makes sense. Of course, there's layers of problems. Right. We talk about that with my own heart, right? Because I'm a liver uh, or a, a kidneys guy. Yeah. Liver guy, liver, right. liver, liver, and then which affects my heart. Mm -hmm. And so there's issues we've been talking about, which is really cool. But leaving me out of it, when <laughs> someone comes in with a heart problem, where is their heart if it has this if it has this really metaphysical sense to it in the conversation we've been having, where is it is it in the where where do you look for it if you had a microscope? You wouldn't, right? So that, I mean, the, o the only way that I could answer that would be kind of segueing into the idea of um, the modern ideas that are kind of stemming from Rudolf Steiner. In Chinese medicine, there's a lot of discussion about the heart and treating the heart. And for thousands of years, it was not viewed as acceptable to treat the heart. Um, you Like there's a heart channel, sort of, but you don't stick needles in it. You would never do something like that because the heart is too sacred to treat directly. The way that you treat the heart is by human connection. The way that you treat the heart is by, you know, resolving these spiritual problems. Ultimately, the heart is more of a, it's really more of a religious concern than it is a medical concern in many ways. Um, so when we treat the heart, we treat it through the pericardium. We treat it through the minister. We don't talk to the emperor directly. Um, so. And we being... Chinese medicine doctors. Correct, yeah. Right, right. Um, so who would treat the heart? The who would treat the emperor? Well, the it's kind of the emperor's responsibility. Like nobody can boss the emperor around, right? Mm -hmm. So in many ways it's the emperor's responsibility to treat himself. It's kind of a strange concept, but ultimately Again, we, we think of it as a as a religious concern, as a spiritual concern, rather than a physical like a concern. Dallas with the heart. priest takes over at this point. Bingo. Yeah. Got it. But so there's a lot of there's a lot of discussions about the heart, and um, central to this is um, it's this idea that the heart may not have a physical form. Um, now the heart, it's all of the characters for the organs, like stomach, spleen, um, pericardium, all of them have a little um, radical, which is just a component of the character, that is, uh, it's the flesh radical, um, which, you know, it, it just looks a certain way. And whenever you see that, you know that whatever you're, whatever word you're looking at, it's made out of flesh. So like stomach is um, field with the flesh radical. So it's like the flesh field. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And then... Is it actually a radical in the way we think of math? Is it something a set next to the symbol for stomach? It, if so all words are composed of radicals. So the stomach is two radicals, which is um, field and flesh. Got it. So it's... And you can have like tons and you can have very elaborate pictures in Chinese uh, characters, or you can have like man, that's just one uh, character, one radical, um, the Ren radical. Field and flesh. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the heart, um, it's the one organ of the 12 organs that does not have the character flesh in it. So some people... Um, Man, that's interesting. Yeah. Shout out to Jeffrey, by the way. Jeffrey is uh, my teacher, and I forgot to shout out to him last time. He's uh, tremendously influential, and I wouldn't be able to have this discussion without him. Um, so he says that the heart is the only organ that does not have the flesh radical, um, which means that something about the heart, even, even when we try to look under a microscope, something about the heart is always going to be outside of physical reality, that the soul can never really be examined under physical reality. So we, one line of thinking is that the pericardium is the physical manifestation of the heart. So when you have your hands on a heart. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You're just holding a pericardium. Okay. Or a shin bao. 
Pericardium is not a great translation. Okay. So that's one interpretation. Of course, Chinese medicine has lots of interpretations. It's a very confusing and long history, and there's lots of different ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, we can begin to understand that the spirit is really the central idea of the heart in Chinese medicine. Okay. So looking at the Cartesian, Harvey kind of approach to the heart, um, you wouldn't find the heart anywhere. But Steiner is unique in that he reintroduces the vital principle into medicine. Um, you know, and there's lots of people that are trying to reintroduce this. I mean, chiropractic in its early days was trying to reintroduce the vital principle into... A yeah, I get that. Because that's why they sort of get a, like a, a quacky or a quirky sort of reputation when, right. you, when you go into that. Because they're trying to reintroduce this metaphysical concept. Right. Oh. And so what happened to chiropractic is that eventually they kind of got rid of that. And now, unfortunately, many chiropractors are, um, you know, they're, other chiropractors think of the some chiropractors as just back crackers. You know, it's not, um, it doesn't have the fullness of the original chiropractic uh, thought. Which could happen to Chinese medicine. Which, and it's happening right now. <laughs> and okay, so get to this now. Get to the tension. And well, we can get to anything, but in my mind just took me to the tension. It's happening to mm -hmm. implies something like a cultural norm is starting to bend and uh, break or, or crush or change a Chinese medicine reality and that cultural norm is Western medicine? Is that what's, what's happening? Is Western medicine starting to do to Chinese medicine what it did to chiropractic? It, it, there's, a, there's a big push from Western medicine, obviously. I mean, Western medicine is a, um, it's a financial giant. Um, most patients are acquainted with Western medicine. So there's a big push um, in order to better benefit patients. I mean, when you have patients coming in that have a certain viewpoint, we usually try to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really a very uh, compassionate move to try to integrate and synchronize our medicines. Mm -hmm. um, it's really coming from the best place, but it is also losing components of our medicine along the way. And there's been, if you go into the history of Chinese medicine, there have always been these attempts to modify Chinese medicine to meet Western medicine. Um, and even within Chinese medicine, uh, without interaction <coughs> with Western medicine, there's people that they're pushing for a more anatomical understanding yeah, of the body. Right. Yeah. Um, so like Wang Ching Ren was this guy who he said, you know, I've looked at some dead bodies. I've like, I've seen, I've dissected some prisoners, like everything that the classics say is wrong, which is like absolute heresy in Chinese medicine. You would never say that your ancestors were wrong. That would, it's just oh, unacceptable. Right. So this guy, it's, uh, the book is called Correcting the Errors in the Forest of Medicine. It's just, That's the actual title. Yeah. But Forest of Medicine is kind of an overly poetic translation. Got it. It's just basically like correcting other people's errors, being a know-it-all. <laughs> so, but to correct an error, there has to be some sort of standard. And the standard here, he's got to be using some rationalized Western medical concept. Yeah, so he... Um, it, or, some, or is he using simply observation? Is he using the scientific method to go, uh-oh, we did that wrong? There's some argument as to whether he actually received any medicine from the Jesuit priests um, that were over there. Because they came with their medicine as part of their mission. That um, And people say, oh, he must have seen Grey's Anatomy or something. You know, he must have seen... Um, the anatomical works that these Jesuit priests had, but some argue that he just kind of came up with this on his own, and he thought that he was he was moving towards a more anatomically based understanding. And he's an extremely concrete person. Um, if you read his text, he really he doesn't have that many formulas. He likes prescribing the same formula for like all kinds of illness. When was he living? Uh, 1800s, early 1800s. Yeah, there we go. I think 1830. All right, so take us back real quick to the notion of the heart and um, Harvey's notion of a mechanical system and then your Chinese medicine notion of it being somewhat metaphysical and then now imagine that I need a 
I need some heart surgery. Would Chinese medicine people open up my chest and do Chinese medicine on my chest? No, what we would do primarily is we would treat you with acupuncture and herbs, which we use for most things. Um, And so for this, it's, it's important to kind of think about, um, it's, it's important to think about the outcomes that we have from our current system Go ahead. Tell, of medicine. Tell us about that. And we modern Western medicine has become very, very good at uh, taking people that are having heart attacks and stopping them and saving them from their heart attacks. Okay. What Western medicine continues to be very bad at is treating people with congestive heart failure, treating people with heart disease in general. Um, you know, it's... The outcomes for people with congestive heart failure, I mean, that they aren't, they don't generally improve under okay. Western medical care. There's symptoms that are mitigated. And uh, Dr. Tom Cowan, he's a medical doctor, and he has a lot more to say about this, um, you know, given that it's his wheelhouse, so to speak. He's a major advocate of kind of, um, I guess, Steinerian thinking about the heart. And Steiner, again, because we, we started with Steiner and then we got off of him. He was not a doctor. No. And he's living in, you know, turn of the, the 20th century. So from the 1900s into the, I mean, sorry, the 1800s into the 1900s, mm-hmm. right? 19th into the 20th century. Um, tell us about Steiner and then get back and maybe we go in reverse. What's the metaphysical aspect Steiner's trying to introduce? Where is it coming from? Like, so who is this cat, Rudolf Steiner? I, I am certainly not a scholar of Steiner, but I will say that the main push for associating Steiner with this, um, with this non-pump idea of the heart is mm-hmm. that um, near the end of his life, um, he said that there are three things that are necessary for the um, spiritual, um, physical, for, for the evolution of man. Um, you know, he believed that mankind, which is a very new world idea, he believed that mankind was continuously improving. Okay. And that he was, that we were getting better and better and reaching, I mean, into a new age of thinking, a new understanding of the world. We were going to get ultra spiritual and turn into like, mm-hmm. you know, just the Ubermensch. Um, not the Ubermensch, that's a different philosophy. But... <laughs> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he said there are three things that are absolutely necessary in order for a man to evolve to the next step. The first is uh, we need to get rid of money. Can't have money anymore. It's just we can't be working for money. It's just lowering everyone. Mm-hmm. The second thing is that there, this, we need to realize that the sensory nerves and the motor nerves are the same and that they both do both, which I have nothing to say about. I don't, okay. I don't understand it. I don't need it. <laughs> and the third thing is that the heart is not a pump. We need to understand that the heart is not a pump in order for our spirit to evolve, in order for mankind to move forward. And the idea that the heart is a pump has been holding us back. And and so in your mind, he, he's trying to go back there to something that had been in place. In, in Orthodox theology, Christian theology, that, that all that language works. And does it work in Chinese medicine language? The, the heart's not a pump. Yeah, it works. So the great thing about Chinese medicine is the way that it's structured. Um, it's, it's not an anatomical medicine. Um, unlike Galen, you know, the problem with Galen is that Galen was doing the same thing as Harvey and Galen just wasn't doing it very well. You know, this is ancient Greece. Yeah. Um, and so then Harvey, he could completely overturn Galen and say, like, I've looked at it, I've I've done the dissections again, he was wrong, let's move forward. Okay. Um, so Western medicine has this continually progressive idea where we're always discarding our ancestors. Mm-hmm. Because of the way Chinese medicine is shaped, we have this progression where we're always adding things on. I mean, there's continually new ideas in Chinese medicine. But there's this interesting current that's hard for Westerners to understand which is that we're always looking backwards. So like, if you come up with a new idea, you have to go back into the classics and figure out where it was in the classics. I see. So you have to go back to the canon. Yeah. 
So in a way, there's no new ideas. And in a way, there's continually new ideas. Well, which would, which makes sense if there is a divine and the divine has been ushered into what we call reality, human reality, there really couldn't be anything new from that in this, or it's probably not a divine nature that started everything. Right. You couldn't really get away from the divine nature. And so you, what the Chinese are saying, tell me if I'm wrong, is that to claim something today is to simply articulate something that already was. Right. And I, I always use the example of um, Plato. I think um, like Alfred North Whitehead had a quote that um, whenever I think of something new, um, I always see Plato like walking back, <laughs> going the other direction. <laughs> Just like it's everything. I mean, all philosophy is really found in Plato. You don't you don't really have to philosophize yeah, okay, anymore. But of course, we, we like to and Aristotle liked to even. So we right. but when you understand it, and you have these new eyes. You look back and you realize that it was already in Plato. That's like it's this um, beautiful kind of uh, mirroring where, you know, we we come up with new knowledge, but all it does is like open the eyes of our heart to see that knowledge that was already embedded in what was kind so, of like scripture in the Old Testament. Yeah, that's right. So then th we're going to talk about how you make sense of this as a new world cat who grew up in the suburbs and practices orthodox christianity hold on one second because i want to hear that but something that i find interesting i can hear a new a new world question or a scientific question come out so plato had all this the ancients had it did, but did the ancient say babylonian fishermen have it or did the ancient i don't know native american iroquois have it is there some equality of having uh, when it comes to wisdom? D did, did all people have it? I think um, I can only say that the answer must be no because of the major differences, differences between Chinese and Greek medicine. I don't think, based on my limited understanding of Greek medicine, that it had the same structures that made it into um, something canonical and something kind of everlasting that appear to be present in Chinese medicine. So there's a qualitative, you don't like that word, I get it. There is a, there's a super force or something. There's a vitality to Chinese medicine that sets it apart. Chinese medicine, it's the way that it's been discovered. I mean, we don't know the way that it's been discovered, right? They're the only culture that has acupuncture channels. But as somebody who works with acupuncture channels every single day, mm -hmm. and I, I'm using them every minute of every day, they, they're they a real thing. They're, you can feel them. You know, if you rub your hands along the body, you can feel them. They're there. So one narrative about how they were discovered is that somebody was just doing a bunch of massages and they said, like, oh, there's a point, and then mm. there's another point, right. and then, and they put together these channels over thousands of years or whatever. The thing is that we don't we don't have the history. We just see all of a sudden around like 200 or so, there's like this description of these channels. Right. Um, so other people say, okay, the channels were discovered through moxibustion first, which is a it's a you burn an herbal substance. It's one of the uh, on the body. It's one of the adjunctive techniques of um, acupuncture and moxibustion. Um, so they say it was discovered through that through a heat therapy. Um, other people, they say that it was discovered through internal cultivation and meditation. So there were people that were just trying to ascend to the next spiritual reality. And they came back down and they said, like, you know what? There's channels. <laughs> so it's, Yeah, I get that. It's, it's, a very, it's a very stark contrast to what Galen is doing, where he's cutting open pigs, cutting open dogs, saying, like, look, there it is. You know, he's not obtaining information from somewhere else. Q. Steiner, Steiner is doing the same paradigm where he's trying to obtain information from somewhere else. He's involved in all sorts of bizarre esoteric and occult practices. Yeah, really occultish sort of utopian things yeah. going on. So 
he is prioritizing spiritual knowledge as the foundation of physical knowledge. And the crazy thing is that it's the, it ends up being the same. Well, yes, it, it has to. If mm-hmm. there is, in fact, a spiritual divine reality, it has to be tied into the material. That's why I never understood the Enlightenment move to put God like far away. I don't understand it, not just as a philosophy. I don't understand it as a reality. It, it, it doesn't help us make sense of things. It actually makes things less clear when they're only explained ever by material you know, uh, uh, methods. It makes it harder to understand things. Right. I think what you, now I can hear a lot of people, especially a lot of doctors right now who are atheistic in nature, who are saying, what are you talking about? I fix people every day. I think that, um, you know, it, it must be very difficult to be a Western doctor right now. Um, for a number of social reasons and, um, you know, just insurance alone is just such a nightmare. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You probably, you're seeing that yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I think in particular, the issue is that I would say probably most people become doctors as a result of their tremendous compassion for other people. And then they are put into a position where from patients' perspective, from my perspective, and presumably also from their perspective, um, their interventions are very often fraught with side effects. Um, you know, their interventions are very drastic, mm-hmm. and their interventions don't always work. And I mean, when I when I see my intervention not working, when I see my intervention causing side effects, I'm I wish that I could do it differently. And I think that they're put into a very difficult position because their human heart, their compassion, um, is trying to express itself through this edifice that is um, very mechanical Mm -hmm. and that's hard to navigate. Um, And it's hard to care for people, I think. I mean, even just, again, even just insurance makes it very difficult to care for people in the way that you think. Care is the weird word, right? So I happen to have a very close friend of mine who's also my wife who tells me about caring Mm -hmm. uh, in a hospital setting. And it's very interesting because the care seems to be like, I don't know, uh, the, 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 the pills that were given, or maybe care is the IV or maybe care is, you know, being isolated and given a breathing tube. But she's always questioning if that's even care, like, the word care doesn't seem to be summed up in that activity of giving a pill. Care seems to be something about a relationship between humans. That's one thing I'm attracted to. That's why I come up to you. There's something about Chinese medicine that demands the relationship ahead Mm -hmm. of the physical intervention. Ahead meaning it's, it's much more important. Whatever that relationship looks like, it's, it's a fundamental element of the care. Right. And, and not like a good feeling, like, you're making me feel good. I really, my doctor really knows me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, it's an actual anecdote, an antidote. It's an actual thing. Like, you would, if you were a Western doctor, you would flip through and go, oh, here it is. This is, okay, so this is, like, a two hours. I just need to sit with this person because it would be literally the relationship is the medicine. Right. And so there are, there are people, um, Western people, that... Um, one in particular, uh, J.R. Worsley, he is, um, a British fellow who was one of the early figures that encountered acupuncture. Um, and he brought it over to England and he had a particular, uh, way of doing it that became very famous. It's the, um, five element school. And he put the heart at the center of everything. He put care at the center of everything. You know, if you see a five element acupuncturist, you usually have these like two hour appointments that are like mostly talking and like Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm, might put in mm -hmm. like one needle at the end, but it's like, they're doing this really elaborate dance that is, I mean, it's medically founded. It's, it's within the theoretical constructs of Chinese medicine, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly not the way that medicine was, 
pra- is practiced in China or Japan mm-hmm. today. And it, mm-hmm. it's most likely has nothing to do with the way that it was practiced um, for thousands of years. But it is based on the same theories, right? Mm-hmm. So there's this interesting thing that happens where the care kind of comes to the forefront um, as being the most important thing in Chinese medicine. Um, and it's true that it's in there, but it was never really explicit in Chinese mm-hmm. medicine. So like this whole idea of the heart, for example, it's not, um, it's in Chinese medicine. It's just, you know, when somebody comes to you with appendicitis and it's like, you know, 1400 in China, you don't necessarily talk to them about the heart. It's just something is mutually understood between the two of you about how to interact with another human mm-hmm. being. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and, and, and so the rational, the, the, the scientific method, right? The interpenetration of reason as the force for fixing that thing we might call the enlightenment method or the scientific method. Did it come to China? What I mean, look at the communist state. They're very rational. Mm-hmm. And they're rational lists. Did that blow up Chinese medicine in the sense that it was incompatible? Communism, material, you know, historical materialism was incompatible with. So, um, one thing that you know, people like to homogenize the history of Chinese medicine, and they like to say, especially in the West, we like to say, "Oh, there's." There's no, uh, there's no distinction between mind and body in Chinese medicine. And it's like, well, of course there is, you know, people realize that there's a distinction between mind and body throughout history. Yeah. It's not just a Descartes thing, but it's Descartes said that's the only way of thinking. Right. He so, was an artist of dualism. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at the history of Chinese medicine, you have exhaustive investigation, particularly done during the Song dynasty where people were trying to systematize Chinese medicine. Um, And before then, I mean, it's... Wild West. Yeah, it's a free-for-all. I mean, it's we're talking about like 200 BC to like 1000 AD. Like everything was a free-for-all back then. Right, like a thousand years of what what I think Westerners would think of as like Middle Ages stuff, like crazy stuff going on. Who knows who's doing what to whom? Yeah, I mean, there's there's village practitioners, and like even in the empire, like there's in the uh, capital city of China during the Tang Dynasty, you have like all five religion major religions. You have Islam, you have Christianity, yeah. you have Judaism. Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, there's just so much going on. Mm-hmm. And then during the Song, we're like, okay, let's standardize. Let's let's bring this in. Let's set up an imperial medicine which mirrors the present um, push from the Chinese communist government to standardize Chinese medicine. Oh, that's interesting. But that was happening outside of the Western context, right? The Song Dynasty. They weren't, well, they were borrowing some ideas, but there wasn't really even an enlightenment at that time. So the standardization was just, it, it was not a Western style standardization. It was Chinese practitioners saying, let's clarify Right. So there's there's always this current of pushing towards rationalism and yeah, pushing that's towards right. that's what I want to get at. you know a more individualized approach and um pushing towards a more spiritual approach and it's it's present in Chinese medicine and then it comes to a head when it meets western medicine and it really comes to a head when it meets the western medicine that we're familiar with because it's important to remember that western medicine didn't look anything like Western medicine until like the forties and fifties. Yeah. You know, they didn't even have antibiotics. So they didn't have JD Rockefeller pushing oil based drugs. No, that's the thing, right? Yeah. I mean, petroleum concept gets into medicine, right? It becomes standardized and that's why everybody's popping pills. Yeah. I mean, if if you just think about how many things in a hospital are made out of plastic, (laughs) I think JD Rockefeller would be pretty proud. (laughs) He's what a mess. Let me jump back to the heart, okay. and this will be an excellent Do it. transition. Yeah. So, the thing about the heart, um, basically, uh, the blood flow is in a vortical shape, in a vortex, um, and the heart itself is a vortex generating object. This is Steiner, this is um, 
you know, this is what Tom Cowan is outlining. This is what... Who's Tom Cowan for everybody? Uh, Dr. Tom Cowan is a fellow who wrote a book, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. I'm halfway through it. It's a pretty good book. Um, and he's got a lot of YouTube videos. He's got a podcast. And he is one of the main proponent, proponents of the theory that the heart is not a pump. Um, and he seems like a pretty smart guy. Okay. Okay. Um, there are other people that are... Um, elaborating upon this theory. There's a good article by um, Ralph Marinelli and Franco First. Um, and they're all coming at it from an anthroposophical perspective, which is the Steiner's medicine. Yes. Um, although I don't think Tom Cowan practices anthroposophical medicine per se. Okay. Um, but he, he's elaborating in this sort of, I would, in the breakdown of modernity, mm -hmm. the postmodern field allows for a reintroduction of vocabulary that feels new worldy. I mean, that feels a uh, new age-ish or something. And he's in that space with the medicine and the heart. Right. So, so go ahead with that idea of the vortex and, and the heart as. Yeah. So if you look at, um, if you look at the structure of the heart, um, there's like this, this fascinating dissection that was done where you can actually kind of uncoil the heart. In one, if you just make one incision, you can just kind of uncoil the whole heart. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the musculature, it's, it's basically in a vortical shape. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like these even straight walls. Um, and what it does is it puts spin on the blood. It, Got it. vortexes okay. the blood. So when the blood comes in through venous circulation, it has a laminar flow. It has a flat flow. And then when it leaves through the arterial circulation, it has a vortical flow. And you can see this vortical flow in MRI. You can see this vortical flow being encouraged by the arteries, which um, in in living tissue, mm -hmm. the arteries themselves have um, these little vortical ridges, um, just like the rifle of a gun. Um, That's helpful. And then in dead tissue, which dissections are usually dead tissue, these ridges don't exist. They've gone away. Exactly. Uh, I get it. Okay. They're so not, their existence depends on their function. Their existence depends on a living body. So this is part, one of the foundations of Chinese medicine is that if you want to know about living things, you look at living things. If you want to know about dead things, you look at dead things. And Western medicine has that flipped where they try to use dead things to learn about living things. Andrew, cut that as the most wonderful opening. And, and don't even cut me saying this. I want you all to hear this. That was, that was really good and very interesting. So, and, But that's a – keep going because I got about a thousand thoughts on that, including that is a, an awful metaphor. I mean, that helps to explain a lot of angst in the modern age. Whoa. So the, the blood is flowing in a vortical shape um, and – Part of the significance of the arteries being in a vortical shape is, um, like I mentioned, that a rifle is in a vortical shape, so the blood flows a lot better. So if you take like a regular pipe and you put, you know, little um, vortex generating, um, if you turn it into a vortical shape, then it causes the f uh, flow to be faster and stronger mm -hmm. and go further than if you just put it through a regular tube. Um, well, that was the – keep going, but that was what happened – when we went from musket to rifle. Exactly. The musket was just a circular being pushed out with force, but the rifle spun the bullet and caused a lot more damage on the other end. Exactly. It's interesting. Okay, so that's the spinning, the vortex. Right. So one of the main arguments for the heart not being a pump, by the way, is that, I mean, the heart is a pretty th small object. It's like roughly one pound, and we expect it, to pump for, I mean, like up to a hundred years, up to 116, I think is when we have some old people that are that old yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just going constantly at like, you know, let's, let's be generous and say it's 60 beats per minute, still 60 beats right. per minute for 116 years. It's a lot of beats and that's a lot of pumping. Right. So obviously it's going to get tired. You know, imagine like lifting weights with your bicep for like... That's not going to go very well. Yeah. So, and part of the idea, part of the problem with this is that we're viewing the heart as something that 
it's working against this resistance of these straight pipes, right? So if you have the pipes themselves encouraging a vortical shape, and if you have the heart itself generating a vortical shape, then you have a lot less resistance. The thing basically propels itself, you know, and it it even gains speed. Um, Tom Cowan has a lot to say about how it gains speed in mm -hmm. the capillary mm -hmm. beds. But so basically the reason that I brought this up is because what's at the center of a vortex? I don't know. Nothing. Nothing is at the center of a vortex. So there's this idea in Chinese medicine mm. and Chinese thought, really, that um, ah. there's, there's this famous story about a prince goes to a butcher um, and the butcher hasn't sharpened his knife in 40 years. You know, anyone who's used a knife, you got to sharpen it. Yeah. Especially if you're using it all day, every day. So the prince says... Hey, butcher, how did you do this? And the butcher says, I only cut into the empty space, right? So there's this, there's this idea that's prevalent in Chinese thought that there's this magical, like, this new thing that happens in the emptiness. You know, when you, uh, when you needle into an acupuncture point, you're not needling into, you know, this or that structure. You're needling into the empty space. Into space. And that's where, um, from the heart's perspective, that's where the spirit really exists. It exists not in the blood. You yeah. can't take the blood out of the body and say like, oh, that's, you know, there's the spirit right there. It's oxygen, you know. Um, but trapped in the blood, trapped in physical reality, we have we have this empty space. Well, and the, the Chinese symbol for the cosmos is zero. Right. The Alpha and the Omega, everything within that space, that what we think of as empty is actually filled with the entirety of meaning. Right. Yeah, we did a pod on that where we talked about what the zero is on any cultural timeline and that, that zero is always mystical. It, it's beyond time. And that space within your being is the actual pump don't use the word pump though right i shouldn't use the word pump no. but it's the vital force though empty people aren't talking about this over the at the water cooler no. and um in fact do they still have water coolers? That's such a, like a Seinfeld reference. I have one in my office. Do you have one? <laughs> I'm the only no, one that uses have, it, though. You do have one. Uh, you do have one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is not in the mainstream of any cardiology. However, it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, the head of cardiac anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School um, said that, you know, this is... This is the next step. This is what we need to realize in order for cardiology to become effective because um, he says that, you know, we haven't really improved the outcomes for congestive heart failure at mm -hmm. all because we don't know why it, congestive heart failure, it's a flow problem. And if we don't know why the blood is flowing, then we can't address it. So every, all of the effort that we're putting is to reducing fluid volume so that the pump works a little better. Or, you know, has less fluid to pump, you know. Or sewing stuff up. Right. Or, you know, doing bypasses. Um, and basically, we're just kind of on the wrong track. But the implication is, is there's going to be spiritual work to be done in order to fix or in order to maybe um, uh, bring to fore the healthy part of us, which is the zero, which is the spiritual center. Right. How do we do that in a materialistic age? It's tough. Um, the way that the way that Tom uh, Tom Cowan talks about it is he emphasizes. Obviously, there's certain medicines that he emphasizes, but um, as far as maintaining heart health, he says we need clean air, clean food. Um, we need to get our feet on the earth, get our bodies in the sunlight, and have meaningful human connection. And there's scientific reasons for that, um, based on, you know, again, the action of the blood and the capillaries. Scientific here meaning scientific method. Yeah. Like good old fashioned, you know, experimentation and all of that. That tells us the s similar things. That really, I mean, it, it gives a much better explanation than our current understanding. So let's just do this. Let's, let's, let's wrap it up by saying, 
Is it right for us to think, sitting here using your expertise, that the heart really doesn't exist as a pump, but in Chinese medicine and maybe in reality, it exists, right, as the spiritual center of any particular human being, and that if we don't understand it that right that way, we can't heal it. Is that something? Would you stand up for that? Yeah. So. Um... That can sound very esoteric and impractical. Um, Good. You know, I when you it. when you Fix get me. into the office with a patient who they had a heart attack, <laughs> you know, they have congestive heart failure now. They can't breathe. They can't exercise like they used to. Um, they can't eat sodium anymore. You know, they're in a pretty sore state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... If you tell them like, well, you just have to realize that the reason you had a heart attack was because you weren't spiritually woke enough, like this, <laughs> you're going to lose that patient for one. And I'm going to not be a Chinese doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't help them. And so... That's beautiful. So we have... That's part of the, the task of Chinese medicine is understanding how this philosophy manifests into what we do, right? So Yeah, right. Not just the words. So we in order to do that, we break out the concepts further. Um so there is there is this idea that fundamentally heart disease is caused by the nine heart pains, which correspond to the nine palaces, you know, which corresponds to health, wealth, um you know, prosperity, relationships, children, uh, career, like all of the things yeah. that can be great and all of the things can, that can just shatter us, you know, when, when our relationship just isn't what we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And that causes this tremendous heartbreak. Um, so that's the basis, but I don't have an herb that treats the nine heart pains. You know, I have herbs that move blood. Um, from a Chinese medical perspective, they invigorate the blood, they break up blood stasis. I have herbs that break up food stagnation and phlegm and regulate qi stagnation and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And we can use these things to uh, move the underlying physical thing. We can use these things to move the qi in the blood. Um, but ultimately, the healing comes from this, from the person when it comes to heart disease, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So blood stasis. Again, the blood is where the shen lives, where the spirit lives. So if you have blood stasis, it means you're like stuck on something, you know? So if you broke up, if somebody broke up with you 10 years ago and you're still holding on to it, that's blood stasis. Wow. So what we do when we move blood stasis with an herb, you know, Don Shen, for example, um, we help the person enter into a dialogue with that old thought. And we can do it consciously. We can sit them down and say, like, well, what happened 10 years ago? Oh, really? Okay. It can look like that? That's Freudian on the couch? Yeah. Um, or we can take what's perhaps a more Chinese approach and not really talk about our emotions and just say, like, well, you just have blood stasis. Let's just move blood. And the healing there happens with the person by themselves as they take their herbs, as they drink them and the thought naturally arises to them about this relationship because that blood, it starts to move. So the blood itself is doing something to encourage the, the other type of healing. I don't, I, it's probably not the right way to say it, but the full healing, the, right. the wholeness. And when you move the blood, people can resist it. They can say, no, I want it there. You know, they can say, no, I like that relationship, oh, you know, being exactly where it is in my memory. And often what you'll see is that those people have side effects in response to your treatment, right? So if I give somebody blood moving herbs and they say, doc, I had to stop taking those herbs, you know, they caused me to feel palpitations. They caused me, you know, to feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep, um, you know. Sometimes the herbal formula could be, quote, wrong, but sometimes the herbal formula is just wrong for the person and where they're at. So when I move blood, I would hope that a person enters into a dialogue with themselves Whoa, and grows from it. But um, 
it's also entirely possible that a person isn't ready for that type of healing. And so they, um, they don't do it. But this is the spiritual life of an Eastern Christian. Really, Christianity as a whole is a tradition. When you go to confession and then you get the spiritual father or the doctor who's assisting you through using the tradition of the church, they have to get you the right medicine. Now, the, the right medicine is always kind of the same. It comes out of the tradition of Christ. It's always do not sin again. And, but <laughs> that's not really helpful, but it's also true. So you, you get a version of that based on your station in life and your ability to control your passions or your ability to see clearly your family or whatever the trauma is, a, a good confessor is, is hitting you with the right medicine in the right dose. And it can provide, this is really interesting, it can, it can provide, right, um, it can provide a way to heal the empty space, which, which actually isn't, hold on, this is interesting, I don't know, I'm just talking. The problem with the empty space is that it's actually filled with your own garbage and you need to clear it. This is very, also very Eastern Christianity. It's to clear it so you can see, the noose can see clearly that which is supposed to, to enter. So I, it's really, it, it really is, Chinese medicine in some way is talking like a, a, an Orthodox Christian you know, sp spiritual father in trying to address the spiritual illness of, of of their children, it feels like the Chinese doctor is doing it for the for the body, but almost like they've integrated it, mm -hmm. which I think is common to the old world in terms of Christianity, Chinese history, the Japanese on some level, and definitely the Hindus. They're all there was never a science of the body. There was always a a way of healing that was scientific, right. but it wasn't necessarily just material. So. Um, first, let me say that the whole dialogue that you're talking about now is captured in the dynamic between the heart and the pericardium, between the emperor and the minister, between the vortical flow, which is expansive, which is, you know, excited, which is self-propelling, and the laminar flow, which is always slowing down. The pericardium governs blood stasis. You know, the pericardium mm -hmm, governs mm -hmm. when the spirit, it's gone out to the world, it's had its heart broken, and it returns back to the heart. Wow. Yeah. To be re-imbued with that life again. With the vortex. Yeah. So um, that's, that's really actually central. happening in my limbs. Right. So, so the, oh, yes, it's an actual, it's an icon. Well, it's real and it's, oh, God, wow, I'm so confused, but I, I'm not. I actually kind of understand weirdly. I just can't say it. When the, when the bot, as the heart pumps, for lack of a better word, the blood is going through the same process, mm -hmm. Right that my spiritual my spiritual self is going through when it's being healed exactly it's so the body out. the body is a mirror of the spirit right um so when you know say somebody has congestive heart failure what's the cardinal what's one of the cardinal symptoms is they have cold hands and feet they just can't warm up why is that because the heart isn't getting the blood to the surface what's at the surface it's the external world. It's people that you love. It's mm -hmm. things that you can be excited about. You know, it's so when you have congestive heart failure, part of the problem is that there's no excitement for life anymore. Hmm. And the way to fix that, obviously, there's medicines, there's always remedial medicines. But the real way to fix that forever is to take the remedial medicines and to fix the underlying problem, which is the lack of excitement for life which is that heartbreak that caused a lack of excitement for life. Yeah, again, it's wholeness. It's not fixing one thing or another. It's fixing all things. Wow. It really does speak to God. It speaks to a type of Christ, right? as can be understood as all things independently are all combined into one being who is the creator and also is manifest and incarnate as the creature. Wow. And right. so wholeness is Christ. And in that sense, in some ways, Chinese medicine is practicing a type of Christian healing. 
Is that, would you say that? I certainly hope that that's what I do every day in my practice. Um, and there's always a variety of motivations that people have. You know, some people that practice Chinese medicine, they're not interested in the spiritual. They just want to do the physical. And they do that, you know. Um, some people have a very different approaches. But I think that the benefit of Chinese medicine as a medical system is that it allows the spiritual to step in and in this so i just wanted to mention that idea of wholeness you were just talking about yeah, it's in poorly, but yeah it's trying. the central idea of um anthroposophic medicine steiner's medicine mm-hmm. the idea that man is seeking wholeness and that by through this seek like through seeking out you know, things in the world he retrieves parts of himself mm-hmm. and kind of becomes a whole person and we have um we have a pretty similar idea in Chinese medicine. Yeah. All right. Let's let's just say thank you. There's more to say. You'll be back. Yes. We there's lots on. more to say we in particular about two. the heart. <laughs> but I think you helped us. And I think that last point I was trying to make simply is, is that, you know, C.S. Lewis talked about the Tao, the, the thing that really encompassed all of human human morality there's there is like a core to what human beings are and then christ is that in 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 human history that which is all in all and other traditions have this but the idea that in medicine there is no medicine it is the healing of the human person that every doctor is after it makes a lot of sense out of a spiritual doctor or a spiritual father what they're trying to do it really does make sense that you go to the doctor when you go to church in the same way as most people go to the doctor. There is a fundamental, yeah, there's a fundamental agreement. There, there, there's a sameness to the activity, which we have to unwind. It's so interesting. You helped us on, on Watar. So I'll just do the outro. Let's do it. Shenis Gagi Marjos. We just talked a lot about some deep stuff. And I think it was done really lightly. I hope so. This is Watar. This is the uh, this is the First Things Foundation podcast that allows you to learn a little bit about the old world while also entertaining just what it is to live in the new. So thank you for joining us. This is Doc Mohabali. I call him my friend James. And uh, he's got a new baby, so we all wish you the best, you and Monica. Uh, we love you for coming on the show, but also um, for helping yeah. understand the old world. So let me give you my shameless plug. Shameless plug, please. March 22nd. Mark your calendars. I am starting a podcast and YouTube channel. Thank you. And first episode comes out March 22nd. Uh, it's called Classic of Difficulties. Um nice. Yeah, so it's it'll be coming out on all, yeah, Classic of Difficulties is it's an attempt to ask, maybe answer, um, like all the hard questions about life and the body. And um, we come at it from a Western medical perspective. We come at it from a historical perspective. We come at it from a Chinese medical perspective. And uh, my goal is that we we develop more questions out of our questioning. Um, I hope that nobody leaves my show with with any answers about anything. <laughs> yeah, I heard the uh, I heard the pilot. It's brilliant, and I, I I walked away saying, "Oh, this is the show that makes suffering much more sufferable." <laughs> this makes the goal of medicine. <laughs> sense of it. it makes sense of it. So, uh, Doc, we'll look for that. I'll keep plugging it on our little show. And uh, Shani Skagi Marjos to all of you. Nakvam dis, hasta luego. You got any foreign languages you can add to it? Au revoir. I stole that one from you. I only know hello in Chinese. Okay, well, we're good. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>